All right, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So the first thing that we need to talk about is how do you set up a web server? Hold on one second. There we go. Mute my other computer. I have one computer here so that I can talk to you guys while I have this other computer to actually do this session. So the first thing is how do you set up a web server? Now, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, I'm going to be showing you how to do that using the Amazon EC2 Cloud for several reasons. The server that, I've, that I'm going to set up for this session costs 16 cents per hour, which means that if I only have it running for an hour, it only costs me 16 cents. And they have a free tier available for people who are learning how to program and developers and such. So that's a great way to go. So let's go ahead and begin. All right, so if you were to want to do this yourself, what you would do is you would go to Google, you would search for Amazon EC2, it would show you the URL here, and then you would go ahead and that would take you here. You create an account, and then once you sign in, you'll see something that looks like this. This is the Amazon EC2 console dashboard, where you can create new instances. Now, an instance is basically a virtual server. Now, does anyone here does anyone here have any questions about what a virtual server is or does everyone understand what a virtual server is? Okay, so what I'm going to do in order to create the virtual server, I'm going to click on launch instance. Also, go ahead and close that. All right, so the first thing is whenever you have a remote server, in this case, we're setting up a web server that we're going to control remotely, you need to be able to control access to that server. You don't want just anyone to be able to connect to it. And one of the ways that you can do this is by setting up SSH. And SSH is simply a mechanism by which you can connect to a computer remotely in order to control it. So whenever you set up SSH, there are two ways you can do this. You can do this by setting up a password, or you can do it by setting up a key. It is recommended in today's world that you not use a password. You should use a key. And when you set up an Amazon instance, it gives you a way to go ahead and create a key. Now, before I continue, there's one more thing that I want to tell you. Everything that I'm doing here, I'm doing somewhat blind in the sense that you're going to watch me go through the same process just as if I was doing this on my own for my own project. So I haven't set up anything beforehand. Uh, the only thing that I've done beforehand is made sure that the stream is going to work correctly and get a rough idea of what process I'm going to go through. So everything you see will be as I, as I do it myself and as I figure things out on my own. So first of all, Amazon is asking me uh, whether or not I want to use an existing key or create a new key. I'm going to go ahead and create a new key. I'm going to give it a name. I'll just call it Live Comp Sci. And then it needs to download that key to my computer. I'm going to save the file. And now it is saved. All right, so next thing is I need to choose what configuration or what operating system and such that I want for this server. So I'm going to choose Ubuntu 12.04. It's a real easy server to work with. And I had already decided that that's what I was going to use for, for this session. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that and then click on Continue. And now I'm going to click on Edit Details because there's a few other things I need to do before I can launch this.
All right, so under security settings, I'm going to create a new security group. Now, a security group is more or less a firewall, or, or it functions like a firewall, where you can tell Amazon what you are allowing for that server. For example, are you going to allow connections on port 80, which is, which is just HTTP or web, you know, web address? Or are you going to allow connections on port 443, which is HTTPS? And so you can define these rules directly. And so that's what we're going to do here. So give me one second while I do that. Okay, so for the first port, I want 22, which is SSH, which is what's going to allow me to actually connect to the machine so that I can, so that I can control it remotely. For source, I'm going to just put this here, which means from anywhere. Now, if I was setting up this computer in a more professional situation, I would probably limit it to certain IP addresses or certain IP address blocks. But for the purpose of what we're doing here, that's not so important. Then I'm going to click Add Rule. And now I'm going to do the exact same thing for port 80, which will allow me to have a web server. Whenever you connect to any website, like up here where you see it saying HTTPS, every web address basically begins with either HTTP or HTTPS, which defines what port you're connecting to. If it says HTTP, then you're connecting port 80. If it says HTTPS, you're connecting to port 443. And so by saying that I want port 80, I'm telling Amazon that there are two ports that I want to be able to connect to, port 80 and port 22. I don't really need, well, yeah, let's go ahead and put in 443 four, four, also because we might use it later. Okay, so that those are the only ports that I want open. And now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and save. Let's see, there's probably a, ah, there we go, create. Okay. And now I can go ahead and save the details. All right, so I'm just going to review these settings real quick. Security group, everything looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and click launch. And that will go ahead and start the virtual server. And then we can go ahead and connect to it shortly. We just gotta wait maybe about 30 seconds while it connects. Now if I go here and I click on instances, you see where it says pending right here. I just need to wait maybe 30 seconds or so, and there it is. Now it's running. Now what that means is at Amazon there is now a server run, a virtual server that I'm going to be able to use in order to build a website on. Now, the next thing I need to do is I need to actually set an IP address that I can connect to. So here's how I do that. Over here, under Network and Security, I'm going to click on Elastic IPs. I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to click on Allocate New Address. And Yes, okay. And now I have a new IP address, 54.243, and I'm going to associate it with the instance I just created. Now, how do I know that's the instance number? Because when I was looking at my instances, that's the number it showed. I'll show that to you in a second. So over here, instances. And you'll see here that I have two different instances, and you see here this one begins with C1E, that's the one I already had running, and that's my computer science for every one website, and then here is the one that I just did. All right, so that's it. Now we have everything ready to go. We can actually connect. So let's take a look here. 
54.243.242.178. That's the IP address I'm going to have connect to. So let's let's do that. Now, when you are using Linux and you want to become an administrator on the machine you're on, uh, you usually type sudo followed by the command you want to run. If you want to just become administrator for the whole duration of your session, you type sudo bash. Bash is the name of the command that is the shell itself, and sudo just means that you want to run the next command as root, as administrator. Okay, so I'm going to go into my downloads directory. And you'll see I have one file there, which is the file I downloaded earlier when it asked me to download the key. So this is the key file that will allow me to connect to the server we just did. So here's what I'm going to do. SSH-I, and dash I is an option that allows you to specify the key. I'm just going to put in the key right there. And then the username for the server that I just set up, because it's it's set up using default options, it's going to be Ubuntu at and then the IP address. So the IP address is going to be 54243242178. Now there's actually I think two other things I have to do here. Double check that these IP addresses are configured properly. Not volumes. Okay, so let's make sure these rules are set up properly. I'll take a look at that. It says port 443 is open, but it doesn't show the other ports that we set up. So that's why I'm not able to connect using a sage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to security groups, and I'm going to modify that security group to make sure that it actually has the rules I want it to have. So let's do that. We're going to say port 22, add rule and port 80. Add rule. And there you go. Now let's let's try it again. Is there a save thing we have to push? Ah, apply rule changes. Okay. And now let's try it. There you go. Okay, yes. Now that message you just saw about the authenticity of host, the idea is that once I've said yes to that, it should never come up again. If it does, then that would indicate that maybe it's not the machine I think it is. Maybe I'm not actually connecting to where I think I am, or maybe there is somebody else listening in and trying to compromise my security. And I'll talk more about that later on. All right, so now we are in the server. So what you see here, this is a virtual server at Amazon that we just set up. And it's costing 16 cents per hour while it's running. So I'm going to go ahead and become root on this server. And now we need to start setting up. Now remember, this is totally fresh. It's a fresh install of Ubuntu. There's nothing set up. There's no web server or anything else. So the first thing is how do we install web server software? Now what we're going to use here is Apache. And the way you set up Apache on Ubuntu is very easy.
first you type apt-get. Now this is the command in Ubuntu that you, in fact in any Debian based Linux distribution of which Ubuntu is one, anytime you want to install software you're usually going to begin with apt-get install and then you're going to specify what software you want to install. So in this case we want Apache 2. Yes, we want to continue. Now it's going to download all of the packages for Apache, all of the dependencies, and it's going to install it. Very simple process. And then as soon as that's done, we should actually have a working web server. Okay, let's see if that worked. When you want to test whether or not the web server is running, the, the first thing you should do is test if it's running on, on the server itself. And we can do that like this. curl is a command that allows you to just download the contents of a web page real quick. So right there I can see what you see here just lets me know that in fact the web server is running. I'm actually looking at the raw HTML code for the index page of the web server. I can see it's working and now I want to I want to see if it's actually working in a real a real web page. So let's go ahead and type in that IP address. Is that the right address? Let's see. Two four two one seven eight. Ah. Two four two one seven eight. There you go. Now if you were to open up your own web browser right now and plug in that IP address into your web browser, you'll see exactly what I'm seeing here because this is a, a real web server connected to the internet and if I wanted to I could go register a domain and point that domain to this IP address and I would be able to connect to this web website via a domain. Now we're not going to do that now but we might do that in the next session. Alright so that is the process of setting up a web server. Does anyone have any questions about this? Shaken Earth asked, do the same commands work on other operating systems? And no, these are Linux specific commands. Now if you don't have Linux on your computer, and in fact this is why I'm doing this on a virtual machine, because I know some people watching this are going to be using Windows, some Mac, some Linux, and I want to keep everything usable for everyone. And so what you can do is you can go download a program called VirtualBox or VMware and you can actually install Linux yourself. In fact, after this session, I will be doing a video separately, just a video tutorial on exactly how to do that. But in this case, we're going to be focusing purely on Ubuntu and its commands. Any other questions? Okay, so now we have Apache installed. That's what allows us to go to the website at all. Now what we need to do is install PHP. Now, I believe that we're going to do this. PHP 5. Now I'm not, right off the top of my head, I'm not 100% sure that this is the right command. So I'm just going to do a quick search. Hmm. 
Now what that did was just to let me know whether or not PHP was already installed. Okay, that showed me all the, this command here, apt cache search PHP, shows me all the packages I can get that contain the word PHP. And that's a little too much, so I'm going to look at fewer results. This pipe bar character, whenever you're in Linux, allows you to take what the last command showed you and send it to another command, which I'm going to use in order to look at fewer results. And the command that I'm going to use for this is called grep. Grep is a command that, well, I'll show you exactly what it does. Like, you see here, one of these results is Z-O-P-H. So if I were to type grep Z-O-P-H, for example, as a random example I picked, you'll see that it will show me the exact same results, but it will only show me those lines containing the word Z-O-P-H. So, okay. So what I did, again, is I just put PHP there so I could see all the results that have PHP. Now I'm going to PHP 5, just so I can narrow it down a little bit more. Now I'll scroll up and I will see exactly what I want. Okay, I want PHP 5, CLI. Now CLI is short for command line interface. I'll show you exactly what that does here in a second. And there should be one. I think there's one for Apache too. Either that or it just automatically. Ah, there we go. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to apt-get install php5 lib apache2 mod php5 and php5 cli. Yes. Interesting. All right. So let's just do apt get install php5. Yes. All right, so when, when you have a situation like this come up, it's probably that the, the IP addresses and URLs that it's using to get your packages are not up to date. So what you would do is apt get update. And this tells Ubuntu to go ahead and update all of the places that it thinks it's supposed to get things and we'll see if that resolves the issue. And now we'll try it again. We'll try the first command. And there you go. Now it's now it's finding everything and looks like everything's working. Now someone asked what the specs are for this server. The Amazon EC2 service gives you choices for what kind of server you want. This is the lowest of them. It's I think it's called micro. There's small, there's medium, there's micro, and this is just the lowest of the specs, which usually is more than enough for what you'd want to, unless you have a huge amount of traffic or you're going to be streaming video or, or something on those lines, in which case you, you choose a higher spec. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure that PHP is installed. First I'm going to just type PHP. Okay, so this brought me into the PHP command line interface, therefore I know PHP is installed. And now what I'll do is go to the directory which Apache is using, and you see this index.html file here. I'll, I'll show that to you. Now, the reason that I know this is the directory is simply because this is where Apache, by default, will put what's called the, the htdocs root directory, and that's what this is. I'll show you how to change that later. 
Uh, but for right now, if I type cat index.html, uh, it will show the contents of that file. And you'll notice that's the exact same thing we saw earlier. This is the file that when you go to that IP address, your browser displays. So now let's go ahead and confirm that PHP is working here. What I'll do is I'm going to create a file called test.php. Now every PHP program always begins like this. Then you can put whatever PHP command you want. I'll just make this real simple. And then you end it with this. All right, so if this works, then I can go to that same IP address slash test.php and I will see, let's, fi let's find out if that works. And there you go. So that is how to set up PHP. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, you don't have to use Vim, but I will be. I'll, I'll be setting up Vim and Screen and a few other things next. There's actually quite a bit that I like to have in place before I do any real development, um, but I'll be showing you that here shortly. So what's really nice here is that just from what we've already done, you can already start to create very basic web programs. You can, you can for example, start writing some basic code. I'll, I'll show you this just without showing you anything new. Like for example, oops, let's try it again. And now if I go to that same page and I refresh, you'll see that it shows me the year, the month, and the day because I used the PHP date function right here. And so you see you already have the ability to start writing some basic programs. All right, so the next thing we want to do is install a program I like, which is called Screen. And let's do that. Okay, it's already installed. So then what we need to do is configure screen. So let's do that. Actually, yeah, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy one of my existing screen RC files that I like. So give me one second here. Okay, so what I just did is I, I went to my computer science for everyone server and took the screen RC that I had there and I just moved it over to this server so that that way everything is already configured the way I want it. Now, generally speaking, when, when you're going to be doing development on one server, you'll have things set up a certain way, you'll have different configurations. You usually aren't going to rewrite them from scratch. You're usually going to just copy them from place to place. And when you're starting out, what you're usually going to do is, is go online and find a configuration you like. For example, do a search for screen RC or Vim RC and just really kind of pick the one you like and save that. So it needs to be saved in the, in the directory um, 
tilde slash, which means your home directory. If I type cd tilde slash and I type pwd, which means show what the working directory I'm in, you'll see that I'm in slash home slash ubuntu. So, And now the last thing I need to do is I need to move it so that instead of being called screenrc, it's called dot screenrc. And now I can go ahead and run screen. And this is what it does. Now the purpose of screen is simply to be able to have more than one terminal, if you will, at a time. If I press Control A, C, I'll create a new one. And you see how I can jump between them, like here. So I can create as many as I want and I can give them names. So what I'll do typically is I'll have one that I'll name, I don't know, let's just say development, another one, maybe I'll name version control, and so on. I'll, I'll show you how I actually do that, but I just want you to get the idea. So you can have as many of these as you want. You can jump between them, you can move them around, and that is how I typically manage my development, especially when I have a lot of different files and directories and, and different operations that I need to do. I organize everything like this. All right, so anyone have any questions right now? Yeah, thank you for that. I was actually going to point that out. One of the reasons I, I picked Amazon for this is because, well, I, I think I mentioned earlier, Amazon has free tiers available for people who are learning and developers such. And so, yeah, the URL that Quickly just gave is great. And anyone can go ahead and, and do this themselves without any cost. And, and yes, Green RC is just personal preference. And I'll show you exactly what it does here. All right, so if we go ahead and look at it one line at a time. All right, so first the escape line. This, yeah, there we go. Okay, this right here just defines what key I'm going to use in order to switch between tabs. I have it set to Control A. That's the key that I use to do screen commands, like switching tabs, creating them, and so on. I could have made that anything I want. If I wanted it to be Control B, I could have set that to be B instead of A. Start a message is a little message that comes up when you start screen telling you that you started screen. I don't need that. Def scroll back tells you how far back you can scroll. In fact, let me just show you that. All right, so let's just scroll off the screen here. Now if I press Control A and then Escape, I can actually start going up like this and scroll backwards. like so. So that's what that is now. Going back here. And then this right here, hard states string, this this line here defines what you see down here in terms of how it looks, what different things you have. Like you see for example here it says for help. That's this thing here that says for help. And anything that starts with a, a hash character is just a comment and that gives you a rough idea of of what the screen RC file is and, and how it's set up so I didn't want to type all of this so that's why I copied it from from my other server all right so now the next thing we want to set up is vim and setting vim is fairly straightforward it's apt get install vim okay well it's already installed there you go all right, so now we can actually start doing some things. So let's go into the veraww directory. All right, so the first thing I want to do here is I don't like having my my web root directory being veraww. I want it to be veraww/html. And I'll change that. And and yeah, it is the screen rc file in fact is at this address.
right there. I didn't mean to hit enter at the end of that. But that's the web address that you can go if you want to download that screen RC file. All right, so how do we do that? How do I change the directory that Apache is using? Well, I need to go into the slash etc slash Apache 2 directory. This is where Apache 2 has all of its different configuration settings. When you type ls, that just means list files. It's, it's like dir on Windows machines, DOS, Windows. And here we have different directories. The one I'm interested in is sites enabled. So if I go here, I can simply edit this file using them. Now when I type part of the file name, I just hit tab and it fills out the rest. Then I hit enter. All right, so you see where it says document root ver www. Now it says ver www html. Let me just scroll through here, make sure there's not anything else. Ah. Okay, and that's that. So I'm going to press colon WQ, which means write the file, meaning save my changes, write them to the file, and quit. Now I need to restart Apache. So I do that by typing service Apache to restart. Ah, my help to actually create the directory I told it to use. So mkdir and then the directory name and now I can restart Apache. And there you go. So let's go to that directory and you'll see there's no files in here yet so we need to create one. Let's create a file we're going to call index.php. Now when you're in Vim, the first thing you need to do is push I on your keyboard. That puts you into what's called insert mode, which allows you to actually type. If you try to type and you're not in insert mode, it will do a lot of crazy things, especially if you don't know how to use Vim. So remember that when you get into Vim, the first thing you do is you, you push I and you'll see this nice little insert up here at the bottom which lets you know you're in insert mode. So we're going to go ahead and create a very basic PHP file that just says this is a test. Colon W saves it and now if I go back to my web page, let me delete this. And there you go. And so this confirms that we have successfully changed the directory. Now why do I want ver www html instead of ver www? The answer is, first of all, when I'm developing something, I like to have different directories for different parts of the project. I might want to have one for production, one for testing, one for development. And so what I want to then have is I'm going to have their www HTML, I'm going to have HTML dev for development, and HTML test for test. In fact, I can do that right now. So I can make directory HTML dev and HTML testing, for example. And then I can put entire versions of whatever project I'm working on in those directories. That way it's it's just more organized. All right, so the next thing we need to install is Git, G-I-T, which is a version control system and I'll explain to you what that does, but first let's install it. So again, it's apt get install, and then whatever it is you want to install, in this case git. Yes. There you go, it's installed. Now, a version control system is basically a way for you to keep track of the progress as you go. If you make a mistake, it allows you to roll back to a previous version where the mistake wasn't there. It's very useful. And in fact, if you go to, I'll get you the exact web address here in a little bit, but there's there's great Git tutorial. I think it's called try Git. 
and it works very well. You can go through that and learn all about how to use Git very quickly. So the first thing we need to do is create what is called a Git repository, which is just simply a fancy way of saying that it gives Git a way to keep track of the project as we go. Right now we only have a single file in this HTML directory, which is index.php, and right now that's all that's going to exist. But Git is going to keep track of that and everything we do to it, everything we do from here on out, and that will be important as we go. So I type git in it. And there you go. That now everything we do here will be tracked. Now we need to add everything in this directory. And in fact, this would add anything in other directories as well, subsequent uh, subdirectories. And now we type git commit dash am. And here we just have to provide a message for our commit. I'm just going to put initial commit. And now, um, actually, it wants us to go ahead and do this. So I'm going to do that. And just so you guys know, that's not actually a valid uh, email address. I don't actually check that. So uh, don't use that to send anything. All right. Now let's go ahead and do that last command. It says, it says after doing this, we need to run this command to retroact. Whoops. Not three times. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, and now let's see. Okay, so when I type git status, it tells me that we're on branch master, nothing to commit, working directory clean. That means everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be, and we now have our version control ready to go. And I'll show you a lot more about how to use this as we go. All right, so we're making good progress here. The next thing we need to do is install some nice Vim plugins, but we might actually wait on that until next session because, especially right now, in fact, I'll explain this. There are a lot of plugins I use with Vim in order to make it where with just a few keystrokes I can create functions and classes and, and different things like that, but especially because we're going to be learning the basics of how to make web applications, I'm probably not going to set those up right away if for no other reason than that you can watch the whole process of writing the functions and classes. Even though it'll take longer, I think it'll be more instructive. Git is used for version control, which means whenever you're designing, whenever you're building a project, any software at all, not just web software, any software at all, you want to keep track of your progress as you go. You want to have a version 1.0, version 2.0, Let's say you have version 2.0 and you add a feature, maybe you want to call it version 2.1. And let's say that you have version 2.1, you add a new feature, you call it version 2.2, but then you discover you made some horrible mistake. Then a version control system allows you to go, to go back to a previous version where you didn't have that mistake, whereas without that you would be pulling your hair out trying to figure out where on earth you, you broke your code. And one other way to think about that too is you could think of a version control system as like saving your game. If, if you were playing a, a computer game and you save your place, version control system is the same idea but for work. But that's the idea. The other thing that version control is good for is if you're working with other people, it allows you to work with each other without stepping on each other's toes. One of you might work on one feature while someone else works on another feature and the version control system takes care of making sure that that the work you do doesn't interfere with the work that someone else did. Anyone else have any questions?
Yes, this is all being recorded. And the way I understand it is that this program will automatically send the recording to Justin TV when it's done. At least that's how it worked for the different tests that I did. So I'm hopeful that when this is done, it will all be available. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on. Now, we're already at the point where we're going to start building the web application framework. But first, I need to kind of explain some of what this is and what we're going to do exactly. All right, so when we talk about a, an MVC, a model view controller, and I'm going to expand on this definition as we go, but right now what I want you to understand is that there are different ways you can create a web application. And let me just go into Vim here so that I can describe this. So let's say, for example, writing HTML code. This is just very basic uh, HTML here. You don't have to worry about exactly what it does. I'm just using it as an example. And maybe we have something that says hello, and we want to put someone's name here. So I'm going to put name or something like this. Now, I could actually write PHP code right here to do something like this. I could say something like that. And I'll, I'll show you what this actually does. Um, let's see. Okay, so if, if we go over to our page here, and see it says, hello, Carl. Now, if I view the source for this page, you'll see that the PHP stuff is nowhere to be seen. In fact, and this is important, the only way you can see the PHP code is if you're on the server or if the server is not configured properly. PHP will actually change what is going out to the web browser in such a way that the person seeing the page won't even know PHP was even used. They'll, they'll think that, well, well, they may not think that, but they'll see just what you see here. So instead of seeing hello, question mark, PHP, etc., you just see hello, Carl. And yes, that is partly for security reasons, but it's also the way that, that a scripting language, a server-side scripting language works in general. Now, JavaScript is also a scripting language. And it's important that I distinguish both what a scripting language is from a, from a true programming language and also the difference between a client-side scripting language like JavaScript and a server-side scripting language like PHP, although JavaScript can also be a server-side scripting language. So here we go. First of all, when you are writing a program that's going to be executed on a computer and you're using a programming lang language like C or C++ uh, and so on, when you're writing the program to be ran at someone's machine, that requires that you take the programming code you wrote and change it into machine code. And the process of doing that is called compiling. And a programming language like C, you have to compile the code. You have to change it from program code into machine code before it will run. With a scripting language, you just write the code. You don't compile it. And then the code is interpreted rather than compiled. And you have an interpreter that will take the code exactly as it's written and then and then display what's supposed to display. So in other words, over here where I have this question mark 
PHP Echo Carl, the, the web server itself has a PHP module that's going to read this code and create a new HTML document that will just say hello Carl but nothing's actually compiled and all happens at server nothing happens at the web browser now with JavaScript on the other hand in fact let's just throw in a tiny bit of JavaScript here I'm just gonna say uh, that should work all right, and if I re let's go ahead and refresh the page. Okay, so you see that neat little alert that just came up that says JavaScript. That's as a result of JavaScript I line that I just put on. And yeah, I will change the color scheme here shortly. Uh, but for right now, what I want you to notice is that when I view the source code. Notice that while the PHP is not visible, the JavaScript is. And that's because the JavaScript is not being interpreted by the web server, it's being interpreted by the web browser, which means anything you write in JavaScript, at least in this way, or you're writing it into the HTML code, will be visible by the person going to the web page whereas the PHP code will not. That is the difference between a server-side scripting language and a client-side scripting language. Client-side meaning that everything is happening at the web browser, in this case, of the person looking at the website. So you don't want to, for example, put usernames and passwords in JavaScript because then someone can see it by viewing the source code. Whereas if it's in PHP, it's not going to make that much difference, although I'll get into more of that later. Uh, HTML5, that's, that's a little bit complex, but let me explain it like this. There are different specifications for HTML. There's HTML5, there's XHTML, and if you go to the website for W, the W3 Council, all those specs are there. I'll actually just very briefly <laughs> Why not? I'll show you some of that. Let's go ahead and put in HTML5 spec. And here you go. So this is the actual specification for HTML5. It has a lot of specifics for, well, let me just see if I can. Yeah. You can definitely go to this page on your own, but the the idea here is that over time, different technologies like HTML, JavaScript, everything basically gets updated, and there's there's new versions, new specs that are made that now have more features or that have maybe new ways of doing things. HTML5 is in in a large part trying to get away from Flash, and so there are a lot of ways to handle video and, and things like that. And see here that this draft is the 6th of October 2012, meaning that they're still working on it. Now, the purpose of a spec like this is if you are Microsoft or you are Google and you are going to be implementing HTML5 into your web browser, let's say the next version of Chrome or the next version of Internet Explorer or Firefox or whatever the case may be, then you would use this document in order to do it. This document describes to the finest detail everything you have to do as a web browser company in order to create a web browser that's going to adhere to this specification. And the reason it's done like that is simply so that everybody is on the same page. If, if Google Chrome comes out with its own version of HTML5 and Firefox comes out with its own version of HTML5, then it tortures the web developer who now has to try to write multiple versions of a website, one for Google Chrome, one for Firefox, and so on. So HTML5 and even the specs that came before, like, like XHTML, are designed in order to make possible that the companies that make web browsers can all follow a, an agreed-upon standard. 
So that's what HTML5 is all about. And when you're writing a web page, like we are here in this HTML code, you can specify what spec you are using for your web page. You can say whether it's HTML5 or XHTML and such, and we'll get into that more later on. But that's, that's the idea. And some of the differences between the specs are very subtle. And so, for example, this page here will work for really any of them because all of them have these different tags and such. And there you go. I just changed everything to white to adjust the color scheme. Although I'm going to be playing with that more later. In fact, let me just do something here. Let's set this to black and there we go. That's better, at least for now. All right. So, anyone have any questions at this point? I actually just noticed the time. It's been an hour. So at this point, we're basically done with the first session. I'll definitely do another one between now and Saturday. It might be Saturday. It might be during the week. I'll go ahead and let people vote on when they want the next session to be. But in this session, we went ahead and set up a web server. We set up the basics of the development environment we're going to use, screen and vim and such. And in the next session, we'll start to get into some of how to actually write PHP code and, and how to start writing the framework. So, anyone have any questions? I think it's great to, to answer your question. You asked if learning Python and, and Django right now is, is a good idea. Absolutely, yes. It's good to know Python. It's good to know PHP. It's good to know C. The, there's nothing wrong with knowing a lot of different languages. And I'll give you an example. A lot of times you might, you might find a, a program that you like and and it's written in a programming language they don't use, it's nice to be able to download the source code and see how it works and understand it. So there's nothing wrong with learning a lot of different languages, whether, you're, whether your goals are to develop games, or web applications, or whatever the case might be. And as far as catching the next session goes, uh, what I would recommend is subscribe to my Reddit page, which is here reddit.com slash r slash carl h programming and also www.computerscienceforeveryone.com and after this maybe tomorrow sometime I'll go ahead and create a couple tutorial videos on how to set up the Linux virtual machine like what I've been using here and maybe a few other things about Amazon EC2. Although in the very beginning of this of this session, I did go through that entire process. I, I still think doing a tutorial video might be a good idea. All right. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? to remember about HTML in all of its forms is that 
whatever language you use, whether it's Python or PHP or you, you can even use E, it's going to be producing HTML code that's read by the web browser. So whether your HTML was written using C or PHP or whatever the language, it's still going to be interpreted by the web browser in the same way. So you can use any programming language you want in order to write the HTML server side. Remember that web browsers cannot understand PHP, they cannot understand Python, they understand HTML and JavaScript. So it's totally up to you what server-side language you use in order to produce the HTML and JavaScript that web browsers are going to see. Any other questions? Okay, everyone, I actually need to take off now, but I'm going to be, of course, available. If anyone has any questions, you can send me a PM on Reddit. Um, of course, my Reddit name is Carl H. And also, if you have any questions, you feel free to talk amongst yourselves and talk more about how to set up the, the VM and the Amazon EC2 and such. I'll leave the page open, of course, and I'm going to now go ahead and close the session and save the video. So I hope everyone enjoyed this, and I'll certainly do more of these later.